Good morning, grandkids. Today we're reading another chapter or two in The Listener, uh, the book I'm writing from the game The Listener. I'm adding a lot more to it, as you can tell. As soon as I left the sanctuary, I saw Shadowmere materialized from the pond. Black strings of shadow moved and twisted until they all coalesced into a magnificent black steed standing there looking at me, his red eyes glowing in the dark of the night. I approached him cautiously. There was no saddle, no reins. I hopped onto his back, not knowing what to expect. How was I to control him? As it turned out, he knew exactly where to go, every step of the way. As soon as I was on his back, he took off. I grabbed a handful of his black mane, but he seemed to shake me loose. Either he didn't like that or was letting me know that it wasn't necessary. It turned out that it wasn't. He was in total control. His movements were so smooth that it was like sitting comfortably on a magic carpet. I knew it was part of the magic of Skyrim. I wasn't even aware of his hoofs striking the road. It felt like he flew just a few inches above the ground. His speed was faster than anything I had ever known. Once we passed a couple of people on the road, and they didn't even glance at us. What? Such a wonderful creature, and they didn't even look? I wondered if he was invisible. If so, did being on his back make me invisible? Maybe the only, maybe only the Brotherhood could see him. It was a mystery that I would ask Astrid about at some point. I did, farther on, realize that Shadowmere was a killer. Maybe that's why Astrid said he's one of us. He took care of any wolf, big cat, or bear that attacked without me taking out bow or sword. Once, when I stopped by the side of the road, a bandit came slinking out of his hiding place in the bushes. Before he could get a threat out of his mouth, Shadowmere had killed him with his mighty hoofs. This was a magical beast for sure, and I loved him. Only the second thing I've ever loved, after Nazir's voice. Well, maybe Nazir. Actually, we seemed to be cavorting with time itself. The sun and the moon moved swiftly across the heavens. The clouds sailed rather than drifted. I felt no hunger or thirst. We soon approached Dawnstar and ran on through it with that same strange feeling of not being seen. At the far end of Dawnstar, down on the lower street, Shadow Mare slowed, going around a bend all along the coast, and suddenly stopped. Well, I suppose we must be at our destination, only he knew. I slid off his back, looking around, and the first thing I saw was Arnjorn sitting on the ground, holding his shoulder and groaning. There was blood seeping through his fingers and blood on the ground, which indicated a fight with Cicero, whom I probably will find injured also. Somewhere inside. Whom I will probably find injured also somewhere inside. At this point, I saw the door, hidden back in an overhang of rocks. Same stone slab, same skull, 
same black hand symbol. I stooped down to examine Arnbjorn and saw that he was injured too badly and that there wasn't anything I could do to help him. I told him that Astrid was worried about him and had sent me to find him. I told him to take Shadowmere and go back to the guild where there would be someone to treat his injuries. I helped him onto the steed's back and Shadowmere took off without a word of instruction. After they headed home, I stood there thinking about what I'd be facing inside this old sanctuary. I had learned that Cicero had barricaded himself inside somewhere and that I would have to fight guardians, whatever they were, and a beast. I was assuming that might be a troll of some kind. At that point, I turned away from the door and started walking back into Dawnstar. Maybe I could find someone when I, when I could, whom I could pay to come back and help me fight through this place. There was a small gathering in the street listening to a man standing up on one of the steps of the Jarl's house. He was talking to them about the war think, maybe, about the nightmares everyone was having. It didn't matter. I saw a young man on the fringes of the group and walked over to him. I asked him, not so truthfully, if I could hire him to help me clear out a dungeon. He said, nah, he was a miner and had plenty of work to keep him busy. But see that young fellow over there, he said, the one in partial armor? He says he wants to go adventuring, but can't afford to buy the other pieces of armor he needs. You might be able to make a deal with him. That'll make you both happy. I walked over to the kid who was in a rather pleading conversation with a brawny-looking older man, who, it turned out, was a blacksmith. The kid was pleading with him for some armor on loan and pay later, which the blacksmith was not going for. I struck up a conversation with the two of them. The kid would gladly accompany me if I could get him some more armor. I negotiated with the blacksmith and bought a helmet, a bow with some arrows, iron ones of all things. Then I saw his sword, a ridiculous iron one, not very useful, and it looked dull anyway. I bought him a steel sword to replace it. The kid wanted a two-handed one, which I couldn't even imagine him lifting, much less fighting with. But he insisted, so that's what I got him. He put on his new helmet, sheathed his sword, which was almost as big as he was, and we started back to the sanctuary. I was watching him and had to laugh out loud. His sword was about dragging the ground and the helmet was a, was a little bit slipped down. It kept slipping to the side, down on his forehead, I was afraid it would be covering one eye most of the time. As I envisioned that, I laughed harder. He stood there in a crooked helmet and a dragging sword with his hands spread out going, What? What? Never mind, I managed to say. Come on. I didn't know how much help he would be to me, but at least he could cause some distraction. If he got his silly self killed, well, he was expendable to me. We arrived back at the sanctuary. I gave the password and we were in. We passed through various stone rooms and tunnels. This place was old and full of rubble, probably unused since the Brotherhood had moved to the Falkreath Sanctuary. It could be cleaned up and repaired though 
My thoughts were for the future. About the time I heard Cicero's voice in the distance, two guardians came charging at us with weapons drawn. They were blue, and I could see through. They were ghosts. Would my blade have any effect on them, or theirs on me? What mystery was this? Were they dead? Ancient guardians who once protected the old brotherhood, still protecting the falling down ruins? I looked over at the kid as I was firing arrows at the apparitions, keeping them at bay somewhat. He was frozen in place. His helmet had slipped over one eye, and his sword was hanging lifeless from his hands. As I switched to my daggers, I snapped, Wake up and help me. This jerked him out of his trance. He poked up his helmet, picked up his sword, and we both waded in. When both guardians were dead again, again, we saw a bridge in front of us with three more guardians ready and waiting for us on the other end. Of course, the kid hesitated, which was a good thing. I had switched to my bow and fired at an oil lamp hanging from the ceiling, dropping it onto the first ghost to cross the bridge, setting everything around it on fire. As soon as the fire died down, the kid and I looked at each other. I nodded my head. He poked up his helmet and we dashed across the bridge. We quickly dispatched the remaining two and discovered a doorway to some descending stone steps. About the time I heard Cicero yelling and laughing about pointy things. And then the kid stepped on a trap and the pointy things started shooting out of the edge of the doorway, eager to kill us. I knew the kid would never make it through, and I wondered if I would. I wondered if an invisibility potion would get me through. Worth a try, and I had to do something. When I drank the potion, I saw, I saw the kid's eye nearly fall out of his head. I dashed through untouched and looked around. Sure enough, there was a pull with which I shut off the pointy things and motioned for him to come on. How'd you do that? He squeaked. But I shook my head at him and hurried down the steps through another tunnel. Still looking for Cicero, I instead found two more guards. The kid was behind me somewhere, probably shaking in his well-armored boots. The first boat the first ghost spoke and said, You can't kill what's already dead. <laughs> to which I replied, I already have several times. All your buddies. Want to go see them? And I literally separated his ghostly head from his ghostly body. I thought that while I was doing that, the kid could have at least been dealing with the other, but it was still trying to take me down. I looked behind to see what he was doing. He was busy hitching up his belt <laughs> with the sheath, sheath and heavy sword hanging from it as it was sliding down his skinny butt. I shook my head, useless, and I hurried on. Cicero's voice in the distance surprised me when he started speaking again. Listener, I knew you'd come. Astrid knew her stupid wolf couldn't s slay Cicero, so she sent the best to defeat the best. There was silence. Then he said in a calmer, more reasonable voice, This isn't what our mother would want, you know. You killing me, her keeper. I finally started seeing drops of blood on the tunnel floors. 
Now I knew that I was going the right way and surely getting closer. I came to a barred door as two guardians showed up almost on top of me. Too close. I was trying to lift the bar while at the same time fighting for my life. To heck with the door. I turned and ran away trying to get enough room to drink a healing potion. Surely my worthless follower was somewhere trying to help. By the time my potion took effect, I realized that both guardians had stopped chasing me and had put the kid on the ground where he was at more than once. He managed to get up and I heard him say, you can't get the best of me. Yeah, right. If we weren't in such dire circumstances, I would have laughed at that one. Between the two of us, we took down the two ghosts. That's when I saw the passage to the door, to the side. Come on, kid. We hurried that way. I became a... It became a snowy, ice-carved tunnel with a hole in the ceiling. Before I saw it, I heard it. A frost troll. How I hated trolls. There was a ramp going up onto a higher ledge, and there he stood, or rather, jumping up and down. He rushed down the ramp at us as I was firing arrows at him, connecting a few times and weakening him. I saw the kid raising his sword as the troll rushed past, knocking him silly and landing him on the ground again. We had to get up there on that ledge. Running past the troll and the kid, I shouted, You've been on the ground more than your feet. Get up and follow me. He struggled up onto his feet, ran up the ramp behind me. Split up. Stay by the camp. I'm going to the other end. I started firing poisoned arrows down at the troll, who was weakening as it started up the ramp. The kid killed him with one swing of his sword. I lowered my bow and stared at him. Good kill, kid. We came down the ramp and started following the trail of blood again, which had changed gradually from drops to splatters. I heard Cicero start in again, almost muttering to himself. So Cicero attacked that harlot Astrid. What's a fool to do when his mother is slandered and mocked? His voice started picking up. Surely the listener understands that. I answered him with, Oh, I do, I do. So I thought Astrid was right about what had set him off. At least she was honest about it. Cicero spoke again with surprise. You're still alive. I respect the listener, of course, but could you slow down a bit? I'm not what I used to be. I assumed that he was referring to being injured. We finally came to a blood-splattered door which opened onto blood-splattered steps back in the stone cave and tunnels. We entered a coffin-lined room where we left, where we both took out more ghostly guardians. It seemed like the kid was gaining a little confidence in himself. I finally came to a large old chest, which I certainly wasn't going to pass by, I opened it and found, to my delight, a few expensive goodies. A dwarven shield worth 225 gold, a jeweled necklace worth 380. We are getting close to Cicero because now he's getting scared. Now he's wanting to negotiate. He's wanting to forget about everything. Let bygones be bygones. But I didn't have an issue with him. He was probably thinking Astrid 
had made me her ally. I ran on until I realized I had circled back to that barred door. A single guardian was in front of it. I quickly looked around. Where is that worthless kid? I was surprised when he walked right past me, casual as you please, firing arrows. I added my own and we killed the guardian together. I turned and looked at him with raised eyebrows. I found them in another chest back there, he said. I think I like the bow better than the sword. I laughed and said, you really should have, have both if you're going to grow up to be an adventurer like me. And I laughed again. I'll buy you a lighter one-handed sword when we get out of here. We lifted the bar on the door and found ourselves facing another door. We went through it and on the far side of the room was Cicero on the floor with blood on him and the floor around him. He said, I feel bad about hurting Vizera, but I hope that hulking sheepdog bastards, which I left outside on the ground, is bleeding out. He does have a way with words, doesn't he? And that's the end of this episode, grandkids. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you next time with another reading from my book, The Listener. Bye-bye, grandkids.